Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. My name is Billy Thomas. I'm an extension forester here at the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. I've got a number of guests with me tonight, including Pam Snyder, and I'll introduce you in a little bit more. Uh, and we've got some other presenters from um, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, as well as the Kentucky Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I'll be introducing those folks as we go along. Um, but before we get started, I want to thank you all so much for being with us. This is the fifth part of a webinar series that we've been working with some surrounding states on. And this one is all about Kentucky, though. This webinar is being recorded, as well as the previous four webinars, and I'll talk about those in a second in case you missed some of those. There's an opportunity for you to go back and visit some of those webinars. Um, and I'm going to pull up a quick PowerPoint and kind of get us started with this real quick. All right, so this is the agenda for tonight. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview and kind of set the stage a little bit. Then I'll be turning it over to Pam. And then we're gonna have Clay Smithson with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And then Dana Weeby with the Kentucky Natural Resources Conservation Service. And then Ellen Crocker and I will wrap it up with some information about UK forestry extension. But before I turn it over to Pam, there's a couple of things I'd like to share with you all. That, like I said, this is the fifth in a series. On the very first night of this series, we, we had a webinar about talking about how to get to know your woodlands. We talked a lot about the history of our woodlands here in Kentucky and throughout the region, some of the land practices that had happened before, some of the abuses, and really how our woods got to the shape that they're in largely. So it's a great webinar to kind of orient everyone and get an understanding of how you kind of came or to inherit or work with what you have right now. Next, we talked about managing your woodlands, and we had some information on both hardwood management and pine management. That webinar also included a presentation by Dr. Wayne Clatterbuck, a UK forestry grad, and he was talking about degraded stands. And that's an issue a lot of folks have here in Kentucky. They may have purchased a, an area that was just cut over or had been abused in the past, so how, what do you do with a degraded stand? So that second webinar was a really good one that covered some of that stuff. Next, we talked about some forest health related issues. We had a number of presenters talking about different species that are causing some concern for us. We talked about plant species. We talked about animal species. We talked about disease species. Um, we talked about a lot of different things that are causing some threats to our woodlands and what you all can do about that. So that's a good one to catch up on if you happen to miss it. And then in its last week's session, we talked about wildlife and woodlands. We had a number of presenters on that one as well. And many people own their woodlands because they're interested in wildlife. And so we're going to have Mr. Clay Smithson talking about kind of wildlife practices that we do here in Kentucky and how you can connect with some of those resources. And then that brings us to tonight's webinar, this final one in the series. And this is all about Kentucky. And we wanted to introduce you all to the forestry and wildlife assistance that's available here in the state. You know, I do programs across the state and many people always come up to me and say, Billy, I had no idea there was so much help available. So we want to use this as a platform to introduce you all to all of these great resources that are available to help woodland owners throughout Kentucky. So I want to talk briefly about the importance of Kentucky's woodlands. And then we're going to basically jump into each of these presenters for about 20 minutes each. What I'll ask is if you have questions for these presenters, please get them to your county extension agents and they can insert them into the chat pod and we'll try to address them before the presenters and leave the studio here with us. So again, if you have questions for each of these presenters, please try to get them in as we're going as opposed to saving them to the very end. All right, I wanna talk briefly about the contributions of Kentucky's woodlands here in, in the United States, or excuse me, in Kentucky. Um, with 48% of our woodlands are, are, of Kentucky is woodlands, which is a lot. Almost half the state of Kentucky is covered in forest land. And it's a huge resource that often doesn't get the attention that it deserves. If you talk about the ownership here in Kentucky, about 155,000 different woodland ownerships, uh, when we're talking about 10 acres and more. Now these ownerships could be made up of a husband and a wife, it could be a group of heirs, or it could be a single individual. So there's a lot of woodland owners out there, estimated over 400,000 woodland owners here in the state of Kentucky. So this information that we're talking about tonight is really targeted for you all. 
Thinking about the employment that our forests provide, we have a very large forest industry here in Kentucky. Over 29,000 people are directly employed, and almost all of that wood resource that we have uh, in, uh, goes into the forest sector comes from private forests here in, the, in Kentucky. We have over 2,500 different master loggers out there in the state, and you can find those easily online, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but those are a lot of folks out there that are, play a critical role in getting your product to market. We also have over 700 wood industries spread out across the state. There's 113 counties that have at least one wood using the industry in it. So it's really statewide. And you might be surprised to know that some of our biggest concentration of wood industries are actually in some of our urban areas. Jefferson County has a tremendous number of wood using facilities, for example. When we talk about economics, we talk about the economic contribution that Kentucky's forests provide to our economy overall. It's estimated that they contribute over 13 billion in total economic impact to the state. And again, it's woodland owners are the foundation of this huge industry um, that does so much for so many. But many of us may not care so much about the pure economics. We may be interested in our wild or in our forests for wildlife or recreation or other reasons. And you know, our forests are a big part of who we are as Kentuckians. Um, I grew up in Eastern Kentucky myself, surrounded by beautiful mountains, playing in the Cumberland River, and um, I cherish the forests that we have here. And it's a great opportunity through this webinar series for you all to learn about how to care about your woodlands. So I'm going to cut it off right here and. And then I'm going to introduce uh, Miss Pam Snyder. All right, Pam, now that I can introduce you for real, uh, Pam is with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. I've had a chance to work with Pam for a number of years. And Pam, I can't thank you enough for coming in tonight You're and welcome. sharing information with um, our audience out there. We have people all across the state um, that are really eager to hear about the Division of Forestry okay. and what the Division of Forestry can do. So okay. um, again, thanks for being here with us. You're welcome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull up Pam's webinar right now. Folks, I'm Pam Snyder with the Division of Forestry. I'm the Forest Management Chief. I have been with the division going on about 23 years. Um, one of our missions is to protect, conserve, and enhance the forest, prop, forest resources of the Commonwealth through a public informed of the environmental, social, and economic importance of these resources. We have um, six regional offices statewide. Um, we have those regional offices are in Madisonville, Campbellsville, Frankfurt, Moorhead, Hazard, and Pineville. As Billy alluded to, you know, 48% of the state is forested, and that's approximately 12.4 million acres of forest land comprised of 75% of an oak hickory forest type. And again, one of the other challenges for the division is 88% of the state is in a private ownership so we stay very busy as foresters trying to provide assistance for forest landowners. Our flagship program within the division is the Forest Stewardship Program. Um, it is completely free to forest landowners. And basically the Forest Stewardship Program, we go out and provide technical assistance by the forester to the landowner in order to write a forest management plan on their property. And we call them a forest stewardship plan. And that forest stewardship plan can cover growing high quality timber. We try to improve wildlife habitat. We also want to provide clean water for the citizens of the Commonwealth. And we can do that through a forest management plan. We have landowners that have interest in, you know, taking advantage of aesthetic or recreational potentials on their property. So this is a big program for the division. One of the things that I can say is we have cost share programs for forest landowners. 
I'm not going to go into great depth right. because Dina Weeby will go into further specifications of these programs. Um, the Conservation Reserve Program is really designed to take cropland with severe erosion potential out of production. And what the division does is basically we, through the Farm Service Agency and through the Natural Resource Conservation Service, we will get a request from them. And basically we will come out and assess the landowner's potential for enrollment in that program. And we do that again through writing a forest management plan and mostly what we do under the conservation reserve program is we do a lot of tree planting like riparian buffers so the foresters will ascertain how much needs to be done and enrolled in that particular conservation or cost share program we also do a lot of requests through the environmental quality incentives program which that was reauthorized in the 2018 Farm Bill. Now that program provides a 75% cost share rate and we do a lot of technical assistance under the forest land initiatives part of EQIP. But we do everything from forest stand improvement to riparian buffers, tree planting, um, enrichment plantings, um, again, you still have to have a forest stewardship program in order to qualify for most of the federal cost share programs. Um, that's the first step in getting um, technical assistance through the USDA Farm Bill programs. Another state cost share program that we provide assistance to is the Kentucky Soil and Water Conservation Program. That is handled by the local conservation districts and a lot of what we provide there again is getting riparian buffers for stand improvement done but that is done at the state cost share program so there is a difference between these three programs other programs that the division has is we have the forest health program which tries to identify um, invasive species and diseases. Um, that way we know when there's outbreaks occurring um, or potential for new diseases and outbreaks, what to be on the look, look out for. Um, we also have the urban and community forest program, which that provides um, determinations for Tree City USCAs, Tree Campus programs. Um, another thing that the division does is basically we have two fire seasons uh, in the state of Kentucky. That's from February 15th through April 30th and a fall fire season of October 1st through December 15th. On average, in the state of Kentucky, we average about 1,500 wildfires a year, and most of those fires are caused by arson. So again, we do fight fire um, as part of our job duties. Also within the division, we have two state-run nurseries that one is in Western Kentucky, which is John P. Rohde, the other nursery is in Eastern Kentucky, which is Morgan County. Approximately, we right now are produce 1.2 million seedlings a year for seedlings for sale to landowners and other entities in the state. The division also has 10 state forests across the state that we manage um, for multiple use. Other programs that we have is the Forest Inventory Analysis Program, which that's a very intensive program. It's run by USDA Forest Service, and a lot of the inventory that we work, work that we do for the Forest Service 
provides a strong basis for economics in the state. So we know how much supply and demand and what we have in this state and, and where trends are going. Um, another program that we have is the Kentucky Master Logger Program. Billy alluded to 2,500 master loggers in this state. Um, another program we have is Forest Utilization Program, which works very closely with the UK Department of Forestry Extension folks on getting information out about first and secondary wood industry. So, and again, Billy alluded to that, that there is an employment of over 29,000 people employed. We do provide other educational material programs through the division. Uh, we provide smoky bear programs. We provide educational programs for K through 12. And we also promote the Envirothon program. So there's a lot of things that we do for division programs. I'd like to, if anyone has any questions, I'd be. Great. So Pam, while we're waiting for some questions to come into the chat pod here, I'm wondering about this picture you've got here, you know, so I see the fire and uh, how are the, how's the fire season going so far this spring? The fire season's been very low okay. this spring because it's been a very wet yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we're really just like one day into the spring, but still. Right, but. <laughs> the fire, spring yeah, fire season. season. Yeah. Yeah, well, so. good. All right, well, we're going to stop this right now, and um, we'll see if we've got some questions. Um, again, folks, I'd encourage you to get questions to your county extension agent. They can get them into the chat pod for us. You know, Pam, I had a chance earlier in my career to work with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, work for the Kentucky Division mm -hmm. of Forestry, and it was such a rewarding experience to try to go out and help landowners get the most for their out of their woodlands, you know. Um, and, and I would like to get a show of hands out there in the audience. How many of you all have a forest management plan? All right, look around. Okay. All right, all of you that do not have your hands up, please contact the Kentucky Division of Forestry. You've got that information in your packet and they'll get a forester out there to work with you. And really it's, and I would encourage you when you go out, uh, when you meet with that forester, right. really spend the time, just don't schedule them to come out, but spend some time with that forester. Let them know what you're trying to do with your right. property because that'll really make that plan much more meaningful and much more targeted to what you want. Right. So, the objectives are what the landowner needs. Yep. We had a question, it looks from um, um, David Embry. Um, how, how does one get into the stewardship program? Basically, you can contact one of our six regional offices. We have a chief forester um, that will take your application and assign it to one of the foresters that we have stationed okay. in that out of that regional office. Yeah. It's that simple. Right. And you, you did mention that it was free of charge, right? It is free of charge. Okay. So keep paying your tax dollars, please. <laughs> All right. All right. So once you complete a forest management plan, how long is it good for? It is good for 10 years. Okay. That sounds good. So again, I want to reiterate, you know, forest stewardship plan is the first step in getting into a lot of USDA farm bill programs. Right. So. And yeah, that's a good point. You know, we if we're going to spend money federal money to help people do stuff we want to make sure that it's well thought right. out right and it's part of a bigger plan right Correct. we don't we don't want to be wasteful with those resources right. so that's why having a plan is so critical and critical really important is. okay all right how long does it take to complete one i guess a forest management or stewardship plan well that depends on several things it depends on topography right if you're in eastern kentucky it takes the forester <laughs> a little sure. longer to go up the hills right. and that um, and it also depends on how big the acreages are, mm -hmm. um, but typically a forester can do the field work in anywhere from one to three days, okay. and then there's one to two days in the office typing it up. And the forest stewardship plan, basically you get the plan, it's broken down into different management units, and you also get a map with that plan and so um, basically we'll tell you what to do in the plan now if you're interested in doing further cost share work we actually write practice plans okay. on top of the forest stewardship plan okay. for landowners also okay. 
you know, it looks like we got another question. I'll, I'll get to my question here in a second <laughs> for you. Um, let's see, um, forester visits, is there help to develop the forest management plan once a forester visits? Yes, a lot of foresters are able to get the plan developed and if the landowner doesn't understand something, they do a lot of communication between emails, uh, phone, phone calls, phone calls. you know, the forester basically, a lot of them work out of their trucks. Right. So, you know, it's literally, yeah. you can get a hold of them. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> you know, and I think that brings up a good point. You know, once you get the plan in hand, uh, KDF isn't done with you, right? No, we're not right? done. We're, they're not walking away. They're still there to support you and help you develop and implement those practices. And, right? an, and another thing I might say is we do work with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. If your objective is primarily wildlife and then forestry, we do a combination plan. Okay. We will write a plan together with other resource professionals. Okay. And, and we'll have Clay in here in a few minutes yes. talking about the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Oh, it looks like we have uh, somebody that has a scheduled visit in April with one of your foresters. Excellent. That's wonderful. Yeah. Good. Yes, please take advantage of that service. It is an unbelievable way to get some good information about your property and, um, and what you can do to really try to achieve your objectives. Another thing I might um, bring up okay. is we have a partnership with UK on the Kentucky Woodlands Magazine. We do. Yeah. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in my presentation. It's a um, it's an educational outlet that's available to you all and um, I'll, I'll brief them a little bit about that a little bit later. Exactly. All right, it looks like we got a question from um, Scott County. Considering forest fires, how and where do we find out about when the burn bans are? We have on our website a section under the wildland fire section where you can go find out what current county bans are in place if there isn't any or if there are. Okay. So, okay. so check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry website, website for that information. Okay. All right, so get these questions in for Pam. Um, Pam, what about if somebody wanted to do like a big tree planting? I know you said you could do tree seedling cells and help them pick out the right trees and then sell them. Is there any other kind of assistance that goes along with that or um, potential? A lot of landowners, you know, they may not be involved with a cost share program. We still go out and provide technical assistance to them. Mm -hmm. If it's tree planting, um, we also do a combination within some of our civicultural practices of enrichment plantings under a forest stand improvement mm -hmm. situation. So a forester has a lot of tools in their civicultural toolbox right. that we can provide assistance to. Excellent. Okay, so. let's look at another question. Does a management plan become binding at any point? No. Okay, so if, he, so if a forester says you should do this or that, there's you're not legally required to do no. that? Okay. You, you, we try to set up within the stewardship plan, there's a activity list and we try to recommend which practices you need to do first. Right. But then you may have a family issue that you can't get to it this year. Mm -hmm. So it may delay you. So, but legally they're, they're not binding, you know, in right. that type of way. Okay. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about maybe actually when you enter into like a contract right. with some of these cost share programs yes. and, now and, that's and th different. right. Thanks tweak a little bit there. And we'll talk about that with Dina a little bit later, but um, I'd encourage you all to get some more questions in for Pam while we still got her here. Um, and again, you've got her PowerPoint in hand, hopefully, and you can see which office serves your county. Yes. And you know, again, folks, please work with these folks. They're great people. They're there to help you get the most from your property. All right. Is there support specifically for hemlock stands with the woolly delgid issues? Well, right now we do have a hemlock um, woolly delgid program, but right now that crew works primarily on public lands. Mm -hmm. That's the way that the funding comes into us. Um, but we have looked at trying to get practices put in the cost share program mm -hmm. for just being able to treat the hemlock fully adelta. Okay. We, we're just not there yet, right. but, but check, mo back. <laughs> check back. Most of the hemlock fully adelta um, infestations are on a lot of public lands okay. and not on private lands, private lands that much. Okay. I'm not saying there aren't not any, sure, any sure, but, but okay. most of where they are, they're on public lands. Okay. 
All right, let's see. Um, after one of the earlier sessions, I started mapping and developing the plan on the My Land Plan for yeah, I'm website. familiar yeah. with that. Is is this the recommended site, or do you have another that you should use? You can use My Land Plan. It's just another tool that a landowner mm -hmm. can use. I believe that was developed through Extension many mm -hmm. years yeah. ago, um, and there. I think the American Tree Farm Program also has a similar tool mm -hmm. yep. on, I don't remember what it's called, yeah, right. but they have a similar tool that's like a Maui land plan right. that landowners can get on and start mapping. And really this is a good tool to use because it helps you develop what type of objectives you might right. want to do mm -hmm. before the forester gets on site. And so if you hand that map to the forester, then you're on, yeah, you're kind of ahead of the game. You're yeah. ahead of the game. You're on a good, clear set yeah. path. You know, so, I think that's a really good point, you know, because really forest management and woodland management is really based on your objectives, right? And the more that you think about what you want from your property, the better you'll be able to communicate those with your forester, and then they'll be able to get prescriptions that kind of match your, your needs and desires. Right. All right. All right, folks, if you don't have anything else for Pam, I'm going to kind of release her from the studio um, and we'll bring in Clay, but I'll give you a final call real quick for any questions. And, um, you know, Pam, as we're waiting for a question or two, I just can't thank you enough and, and the Kentucky okay. Division of Forestry for all you do for Kentucky's woodland owners. I appreciate it. Yeah, you, you are a great, out, outstanding organization, and um, we're just really delighted to be a good partner with you. Okay. So well, thank you so cool. much, Pam. And um, we'll say goodbye to Pam, and um, I'll thank her very much. Good evening, and, folks. <laughs> and I'll be introducing um, our next um, presenter right away. All righty. All right, folks. Well, we've got our next presenter in here tonight. Um, I have Mr. Clay Smithson. Clay is a private lands biologist with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And um, Clay is one of those folks that can come out if you're in his area and meet with you and help you develop wildlife related practices and things that will help wildlife on your property. And Clay, I guess we got counter, you got counterparts across the state that can kind of do this for folks too, right? Private lands biologists all over. Yeah, Kentucky, Billy, right? we've got guys that are, um, we've got, uh, I believe, 13 private lands biologists. Right. And we also have some uh, additional staff that work um, with a lot of the farm bill programs right. to do wildlife habitat work. Okay. So we have guys all over the state, um, got it covered. That's, a lot of opportunity. It's a, it's a great opportunity, great resource for landowners to do that. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Clay's presentation. Again, like we did with Pam, I'll ask you to kind of get those questions into the chat pod, and we'll kind of, kind of address those as we go. All righty, Clay. All yours. Okay. Thank you, Billy. Um, we work uh, with the department, with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, working with private landowners. We utilize the Habitat Improvement Program, and basically, what this program does is it does provide um, a very similar service to the to the Kentucky Division of Forestry, wherein we, we will come out, have a look at uh, properties, um, get a feel for what the landowners' goals are for wildlife habitat, or for the species that they're really most interested in. Um, lots of folks are interested in deer and turkey management, and then we also have uh, plenty of people who are still um, uh, are, who still have a very strong interest in uh, small game, uh, things like quail and rabbit. A lot of folks are interested in uh, songbirds, um, so we basically try to tailor the recommendations that we make to the landowner's goals as far as the species that they have the most interest in. Um, so but that's our that's our uh, that's our real main focus is is just really trying to help folks uh, achieve their their goals on their uh, property. And before I get started uh, with with the next slides, um, I also probably need to explain that when I make visits to private property, um, I am usually fairly focused on open fields. Um, I I can make some 
uh, general recommendations for forest land. Uh, but if I see issues, you know, that require the in-depth uh, assistance, that's when I'll refer folks to the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Oftentimes, I will, as Pam mentioned, make a visit with one of their foresters and provide some input on that very comprehensive forest stewardship plan. And so, so those will definitely tie together in a, a very nice package. Um, but the slides I'm going to present, the information at the beginning of my program is going to be geared toward open, open field habitat. And so with that, I will get started. How we can help. And again, as I mentioned, we've got free technical guidance with no obligation. There are no strings attached to it. The minimum size for uh, farm visits for us is uh, 25 acres. So folks have to own 25 acres for us to make the farm visit. If it's less than 25 acres, we can help out uh, through uh, telephone or email consultation. Uh, we, can, we can provide some information that way. Uh, we also can provide lo loans of equipment, uh, such as sprayers, uh, specialized planters uh, that uh, people can use. We don't charge for those. And also at times we can provide the seed and or the herbicide for, for lots of the projects that we will uh, talk about with folks. So we can provide a lot of the material support for, for this type of work. Um, we can also basically provide the link uh, to some more extensive farm bill programs whenever it's suitable. And um, you're gonna hear more about that tonight. And, and there are some really nice opportunities there to get some larger, larger scale work done. The way to find us is um, to go to our homepage and it is listed on the slide, also listed in your, in your PowerPoint handout. Um, when you go to that homepage, find My County Contacts, and you will be able to find the Private Lands Wildlife Biologist on that contacts page. And so it's a very easy way to find out who you can contact to have come out to give you hopefully some good advice. So the first, probably one of the most uh, major practices that we typically recommend are um, things like native warm season grasses. These are native prairie grasses that, that once covered a lot of Kentucky's landscape that we are trying to bring back. And for reasons of ours is because it provides critical cover for a uh, small game, for songbirds, um, but also for deer and for uh, turkey. Very good cover. These are cover plantings. Um, I'm gonna talk about food in just a minute. Um, but this is a great way to bring back, you know, part of a natural ecosystem that we had at one time. And I'm gonna go through this just a little bit. And out in Western Kentucky, we have some remnant stands. We have some barrens, we have some uh, glades out there. And where we do find those, we can help to restore those and, and expand on those. Here in the inner bluegrass, um, we do not have that. So we have to start from scratch. Oftentimes we'll use herbicides uh, to basically prepare the site, to prepare the field. And I'm gonna get more into that in just a minute because most of our fields are, are typically, um, they're typically composed of uh, Kentucky 31 tall fescue, um, which was introduced several years ago. And it, and it covers much of the open ground landscape that, that we have to work with. So we basically go in there, we're gonna site prep with an herbicide. Um, at times we'll use some prescribed burning um, to prepare the site of this very thatchy uh, fescue type grass, um, or it could be mown to prepare to spray. Once it's sprayed, once, once we have the competition under control, then we look at planting. We use lots of different mixtures. Um, we use mixtures that contain uh, species like switchgrass, Indian grass, big and little blue stem, and we also in, include some forbs which is just a way of saying uh, wildflowers. And uh, those are essential for food production from a seed standpoint, but also for pollinators, which are becoming more and more critical um, as we, we look a little bit deeper into things. There's some of the species are listed there. And 
to uh, plant the native grasses, the best way that we've found to do this is to use a no-till drill. We, we typically do not broadcast these. It's in the very select uh, few sites that we do broadcast, but basically the no-till drill, it, it's a really excellent way to plant anything. Because, because once, that, once the competition is controlled, um, this is a piece of equipment that hooks on the back of a tractor, it's towed behind the tractor, it makes a slit, uh, shallow trench in that dead sod, puts a seat in that trench, packs it shut again, and it's a one step planning process. Whereas with any kind of broadcasting, you're looking at about three or four different trips over the field with a tractor. So this is one trip over the field, one and done, um, excellent way to plant, but also the way to plant the native grass. And fescue eradication and side prep, which I covered just a little bit. There's a couple of photos for you. Um, we also recommend the native grasses for uh, summer forage production for cattle producers or for hay production. Um, these uh, grasses grow during the summer uh, when most of the cool season grasses like fescue and orchard grass are basically going uh, somewhat dormant. Um, these uh, grasses during that time are thriving, they're, they're growing heavily. Um, they can be used for, for lots of different purposes when other plants aren't uh, available to uh, cattle or for hay. Um, they're also extremely drought tolerant. And I've seen several years where the only thing, the only green field that I saw were fields with the native grasses in them. And, and they were growing tall, just like in that picture on the on right hand side shows. You know, I've seen those fields during severe droughts. And so they're extremely drought tolerant, very deep roots. And I talked about eradicating fescue. Uh, there are some problems with tall fescue. Uh, fescue was brought in, I believe, back in the 1960s, um, back when there was an extensive erosion problem across the state. Lots of hillsides were washing away. Tall fescue was brought in to fill the gap uh, to hold that ground in place because it will grow anywhere. Um, just barely short of growing on a rock. It's very close. But the issues with tall fescue is, is that there is a fungus that thrives in the fescue that can, uh, in, that can really have an effect on the health of uh, not just cattle, but also things like rabbits. Um, it, can, it can really bring their uh, reproduction rates down. And it also grows too thick. It basically makes a sod. And there's a lot of um, the small game like quail, there's a lot of birds like quail, turkey, songbirds, who, who have to feed on bare ground. They have to find their food. And if it's a, if it's a thick turf, uh, first of all, there's not gonna be food there. And second of all, if there was, they couldn't find it anyway, because it is a thick turf. The best ways we found of controlling fescue, we've tried all kinds of things. We've tried plowing, disking, burning, and all the above combined. But what, what we have found is typically a single application of a uh, non-selective herbicide like Roundup or, or any of the, the generics um, will we'll do a good job at controlling the fescue. Now, actually, actually not just controlling, but, but actually killing those plants uh, when they're actively growing. And um, there's a lot of folks, you know, that, that aren't real keen on using herbicide, and I can understand that totally, but every, everything's a trade-off. And so we see one trip over the field with, with Roundup, um, that that's a worthy trade-off for years of better habitat. There are there are so some there are also some supplemental techniques to prepare the field before spraying. I think that I mentioned before. Um, those those thatchy fields can be burned um, to encourage new growth of what you want to control with herbicide, and also to save on herbicide because you're just applying to green growing material and not dead thatch, or they can just be mown. Um, most folks are not honestly comfortable with doing prescribed burning on their own uh, to, pre to prepare for spraying. So basically mowing is, is, is a, a fine way to get that field ready. Planting a smother crop after spraying. Um, at times in the fall, when we use Roundup in the fall to kill fescue, 
Um, it is a possibility to go in there and plant winter wheat to help to control some weeds for the next season and uh, to con just to keep those weeds under control for that first growing season. And kind of the rough timeline, which I, which I hadn't mentioned, was that um, for, a, for a spring planting, which is when they're typically planted, uh, we, we try to shoot for May or early June to plant the native grasses. And that, seem, that may seem late to a whole lot of folks who are used to planting the cool season grass. But if you remember, these are warm season grasses. And so May and June is a fine time to plant. And we typically target the middle part of April to do the spraying or if it's fairly level ground to do it actually the fall before. You can get a very good, you get very good control of fescue with uh, the fall springs. So we have some options there. Okay, now we'll go from the cover side of things and in, into the food side of things. Oftentimes we'll recommend legumes. And basically a, a legume is any plant that can fix nitrogen out of the soil that is not available to other plants. And the, the legumes that are, in, that are very popular to produce forage for wildlife are things like white and red clover. Uh, Korean and Koblespediza, we don't use that quite as much as we used to, but that's still an, an option for extremely poor soil. Uh, alfalfa is another legume that uh, does make excellent forage for wildlife. And when we talk about forage, um, this isn't just forage for uh, adult animals and birds, like adult, um, it isn't just for deer and uh, adult turkeys, which it's excellent for them, but it's also really critical for things like turkey and quail chicks, because when they hatch, they have to get the protein very quickly. They gotta put those uh, protective flight feathers on. They have to get a lot of protein to do that. And uh, the legumes are excellent for drawing in insects, which are about 80% protein. Um, so that is an excellent uh, way to get some great nutrition to a lot of young birds that really need it. And um, so it does provide forage for adult birds and for young birds too. And the young birds are really critical to uh, population management. The legumes can either be, once again, no-tilled or broadcast. It's much more common to broadcast the legumes than it is for the native grasses using conventional tillage and uh, broadcasting. And um, at times, you know, based on soil tests, uh, there may be a need to apply some lime or to apply some fertilizer. The nitrogen is not needed because those plants can pull the nitrogen out of the soil that's not available to the other plants, so they don't need nitrogen added. Um, so that is, um, that does definitely help on the fertilizer cost. And uh, again, um, you would need to, you would need to eliminate the fescue or any competing cool season grasses before you planted the clover. That's one thing about fescue and some other cool season grasses is that, is that they're highly aggressive and they will basically crowd out anything else you plant. So you have to deal with that first and do your best job at that because you get really one shot at it. Uh, another um, set of practices is strip disking and strip mowing. The way that's done is that you basically divide your fields into um, 30 to 100 foot wide strips. It can, it can really be variable. And with the disking, um, you would basically disk or till each strip um, once every three years in uh, February. Basically any time during the dormant season is great. We prefer late winter, early spring, just to, just to leave some cover there over the, over the hard part of the winter. Uh, but what the, uh, what, the, what the disking really does is, especially if the fescue has been sprayed, um, is that it will break uh, the top layer of the sole open and it'll expose a lot of seeds that have been waiting for a long time for their chance to grow. Um, it'll give them a chance to go ahead, germinate and grow. These are things pe that people typically look at as weeds. And, um, but these are basically uh, beneficial weeds, things like foxtail, ragweed, 
Um, they don't sound too too good to us, but but they are awesome food and cover producers for wildlife. Once again, especially for small game. Um, so we have a whole free crop of seed that's in the ground. Um, that's it's an excellent option, especially for places that that um, you're not going to see daily on your farm. Maybe on the back of the farm somewhere. You don't you don't have to you know, have other folks come up and ask you why you planted a bunch of weeds. So you can put it back on the back of your property or places that aren't commonly seen and it makes outstanding habitat just by spraying and letting, letting that natural regrowth occur. Uh, you can also uh, go in those uh, disc strips and you can overseed those with, with some of the legumes like the clovers. The strip mowing um, uh, is basically a management tool. And again, these are rotationally treated strips. So you basically treat one strip, you leave two untreated, treat another one, and then you rotate those each year. Uh, and again, during the dormant season. Um, and as I mentioned, you treat each uh, strip every one to three years. The goal of the strip mowing is, is to really keep trees at bay. Um, because trees are always wanting to come back on open field sites. That's just what they do. And so to maintain a, a, a certain type of habitat, we need, to, we need to keep those in check. And that's what the strip mowing will uh, accomplish. March or September, and it, yes, and avoid the nesting times. Annual grain food plots, um, they're a source of food. Um, and it's important also from the standpoint that you're disturbing and tilling the ground when you're putting in annual food plots. And so uh, again, you're, you're, you're exposing another uh, backup free crop of seed. Um, and using uh, some strong stemmed annuals that are gonna last for cover too over the winter. The winter uh, conditions will not flatten them out. So you're gonna have that secondary benefit of having some really good cover. Um, things like corn, milo, which is a short sorghum, millet, uh, sunflowers, um, which are very popular for uh, dove fields. Um, these are some examples of some species that you could use. And these are rotationally planted if it's done right. Uh, because again, those can be planted one year and then, then that food plot can be replanted again in a new site the next year and, and that can be rotationally done just to take advantage of that uh, of the free habitat that's gonna come up as a result of the tillage. And again, you would divide your field into strips or blocks. Oftentimes, um, uh, around the outer perimeter of fields is a great place to put annual grain food plots because it does provide some very important edge cover, that transition area where fields meet the woodlands. And again, lime and fertilize based on soil tests. There's uh, another very popular practice is to, uh, is to install nesting boxes. And um, there are plans on the internet where you can build your own. There are vendors that sell nesting boxes. The one thing I will say about nesting boxes that you buy is to never buy a bird box with a perch on it. Um, lots of them come with perches because I, I guess folks think it has to have one. But when, when you put a perch on a nesting box, you're just inviting house sparrows in. And house sparrows are non-native birds that are very aggressive, that will take over the box, and then also evict other birds that are already in there. So do not put a perch on a nesting box. The bluebird boxes, excellent way to provide them some really important habitat. Um, you can put those around field borders on uh, fence posts, and they work out great. Oftentimes you'll get uh, tree swallows in, in there too. Um, kestrel boxes, Barn owl boxes, um, well, we are very concerned about barn owls uh, because there's been a real severe decline in their numbers. And so um, the barn owl boxes are great for older barns on pieces of properties, you know, that aren't really frequented by people very often um, that have appropriate cover for, uh, for things like um, the smaller prey animals like uh, mice, voles, and that type of thing out in the fields. Martin boxes are very popular. Bat roosts, there's, every time you turn around, there's a new design for a bat roost. Um, some work better than others. Okay, forest openings. We'll get into the forestry practice real quick. Um, 
use the fields you have first to do your open field management is uh, probably the best advice on this. But um, if you don't have enough open fields to work with, then you can make small quarter to two acre uh, forest openings. And you can scatter these across the property where the terrain allows. Um, you have woody versus herbaceous cover. Um, what, what we tend to do with these forest openings, you have a couple options. You can let it regenerate back into that, into that next generation of woodland. Um, or you can go in there and plant things like food plots, like the uh, perennial food plots like clover. And in the EQIP program that you're going to hear about, there's a practice called patch clear cuts, which pays $630 an acre to open up, um, to, to make these small clear cuts in open areas. And so, um, yes, it's expensive to do this, especially when you involve mechanized equipment. But, but when you have an incentive payment or a cost share like this, that uh, helps us soften the blow. But do not, do not, do not, do not. Do not do um, patch clear cuts or edge feathering I'm gonna mention if you have non-native invasive plants present. Things like bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, those things will jump in there and, and you're just giving them a big boost by just by taking away the, the uh, shade of the canopy. So you don't, so you don't wanna do that then. Edge feathering, um, basically you go in, into the edge of the woods you take out a certain percentage of the canopy to allow new growth at the ground um, to create that brushy cover. And there are three 50 foot wide zones. Uh, you treat those differently. And in those three zones, you, you see how much of the canopy that we recommend that you remove. It can be used as a thinning or as a, 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 a timber stand improvement or a forest stand improvement where you really focus on leaving the, um, uh, the beneficial hardwood trees and, and what that can do is that can encourage um, the regeneration of those trees by opening up the canopy. Uh, snags, snags and cavity trees, a, a snag is a dead tree and they have no effect on, on the growth of other trees because they do not compete for sunlight. Um, the cavity trees provide in, in important dens for wildlife. Um, or nesting sites. Um, these can range from squirrels to um, squirrels to owls to different types of woodpeckers. Um, lots of critters use nesting cavities. And so um, having at least a couple or a, a, a few of those per acre is an excellent idea. With the recent um, demise of the ash trees, um, we have currently we have lots of snags. Um, but once those start to hit the ground, then um, we're, if there's any benefit to losing the ash, that, that may be one, but that will be gone at that point. Uh, salt licks, um, very, very popular practice for folks that are, that are really interested in managing for deer. Um, these help both does and bucks. It isn't just for growing big antlers. Um, there's a lot of commercial mixes out there on the market, um, but we like to keep things simple. And you can see kind of that recipe up there um, that uh, you can get at your local farm store in as a uh, trace mineral salt for, for livestock. And you would basically pour the granulated mixture on the soil uh, and take a garden hoe and just mix it in, kind of chop it in there. And watch out for the commercial products that have sugar um, because that's a very popular thing that they like to sneak in there. And uh, you know, the deer don't make it to the to the dentist very often, Billy. I didn't realize that. <laughs> that is true. There are very few deer dentists out there. And so, and so we can actually cause some health issues. Um, woody debris, um, things like brush piles. These are beneficial to, to game and non-game animals. And again, small game. Things like rabbit, uh, quail, even uh, turkey nesting. Um, this can greatly benefit them. And it's an extra benefit for the patch clear cuts where the debris can be, can be basically uh, piled over on the side of the patch clear cuts. Um, that works out really well. And you can also scatter brush piles through the woods on the edge of the woods. Um, one very popular way to make um, brush piles is to, is to do what we call hinge cutting of cedar trees. 
where a partial cut's made just enough where you can push it over in the, in the direction you want. And you can hinge cut two or three cedars and push them into one pile and basically have a living brush pile. It's an outstanding way to do it. And you can see the, uh, the uh, specifications there for those. Wildlife water holes, that's another great practice, even in the woodland, um, to provide um, some additional water resources for land animals. Um, small drainages, hilltops, fields, oftentimes the best ones are on ridge tops where there's a uh, clay under laying, lying layer uh, that will help to kind of to provide a seal up on a ridge top. And basically the rain keeps them full and there's very little leakage if, um, if uh, that can be built in, into that clay layer, which is really common. Um, and the goal is a permanent water source. You can either use excavation of basically a bowl or you can create a dam to, uh, to hold back water. And we're talking about something four to eight feet deep, 30 to 60 feet in diameter. We're not talking about a uh, fishing pond. This is just a water hole. And also you can put what's called an ephemeral pool next to it with, 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 with some cover for the amphibians. And, and with, the, with the wildlife water holes, that's a great, second benefit. That's a great secondary benefit because a lot of our uh, frogs, salamanders, um, uh, they really have a hard time. We don't have the right kind of habitat and that's what this is. Um, you want to avoid, you know, building dams across large watersheds. Um, that can be very difficult to achieve success with over, over the long term. And I believe that's the end of my uh, program. And I don't know if we have any questions or not. Well, we'll let these questions come in. Okay. And, and um, you know, Clay, one of the things you were talking about really kind of struck me as um, something that folks may not realize is that there's a lot of compatibility between forestry practices and wildlife practices you know for example you were talking about those um, openings in the forest yes you know yes. that size of opening around that half acre to two acres that also happens to be the perfect size to regenerate oak sure. uh, around sure. there so just one example of how these things can be really hand in hand with one right another. they can be integrated and they can provide those those dual benefits right yeah 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 and and that's what we and the foresters try to achieve when we make Woodland recommendations. Right. You know, we try to find things that are going to provide benefit, you know, for um, for all parties concerned, whether it's timber production, right. whether it's forest health, um, wildlife habitat. We are looking at all those factors, right. and, and we try to get those things to mesh here we can. Oh, and, and you all do a great job. Yeah. I've seen it in practice many times. Yeah. Folks, please get some questions to your county extension agents if you have any for Clay. You do have the contact information where you can find your own private lands biologist or a farm bill biologist that can come out and work with you. And again, as Clay mentioned, um, he works hand in hand with the Division of Forestry and they do that across the state. So getting both those folks out there at mm -hmm. the same time is just an amazing opportunity for you. All right, got one question. Um, how far do purple martin boxes need to be from other things? From other things. Um, the ones that I've seen used the most successfully uh, by purple martins are um, that they are ones in, 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 in very open areas, things like lawns, especially lawns that are near water sources like ponds because the purple martins do feed on insects, on flying insects, and it's also a nice side benefit because eat a lot of mosquitoes and that's fine with me. <laughs> um, so you do want to leave plenty of room in between nesting boxes and other structures, trees, um, the way they take off and the way they land on those boxes, they have to have a little room. Uh, so they need a pretty good runway to get in there. Thank you. Yep. All right, yep. looks like we got another one. Has anyone studied the mineral needs of deer? I know the red iron oxides are not well absorbed by cattle. Um, there has been some extensive testing on uh, the mineral use by deer and the positive and the negative effects of maybe some minerals. Um, but we focus heavy on dicalcium phosphate, which is heavy in calcium. Mm -hmm. um, it it, it uh, does it does promote um, a little bit of additional mass in antlers because those are bone. Um, and also it uh, helps out does because when does are pregnant, they're forming that fetus, they're forming that skeleton, 
And when it comes time to lactate, that extra boost of calcium will definitely help the milk production too. So you know, we, 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 are, we are careful to kind of stick with the proven things, right. things that are proven safe and effective. And sure. So that's so, what we go by. So you mean everything you see on TV or read the magazines <laughs> not true? You mean the hunting shows <laughs> yeah. with the country music star? Right. <laughs> no. All right, we got another. Sure question. <laughs> yeah, we got another question. They're here. really good country singers. Got to be true. <laughs> got to be true. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, what are the recommendations for building nesting boxes? And I guess it would depend on the type of box. Yes. So. Yes. Yes. That will depend on the species that you want to attract with a nesting box. Um, the specifications, you know, such as the dimensions of the box, how they should be placed. Um, those are uh, available online, and um, I, I believe they're on our department's website. We have a list of, and I'm, and I'm glad this came up to help me remember this, but on our department's website, um, you can access some uh, PDF pamphlets, which are called Habitat mm -hmm. How-To, and what those do is they go into the nuts and bolts of how to do these things, and they provide the dimensions for nesting boxes in that nesting box brochure, um, Ducks Unlimited on their website, uh, they provide the dimensions and installation in instructions for wood dug boxes. So there are lots of resources out there to, to find the information out. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see, it looks like another question here. You mentioned mowing in March and September to avoid nesting times, I believe. Will March mowing be okay to avoid interfering with rabbits having young as well? That's a good question. Rabbits will typically not start having young until um, early to mid-April. And so that's when, that's why we, we, we talk about March. Um, and we try to hold the line at March um, for that very reason. Absolutely. Got, a, got another question about bat box or mm -hmm. bat roost this time. You mentioned that there are good bat roosts and not so good ones. What makes a good one? Okay. Um, uh, the traditional bad boxes of old were the boxes that were basically flat rectangles that attached to the sides of buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, and those were found to be not real beneficial to bats, but um, if uh, you wanted to manage for more wasps, they were outstanding. <laughs> I'm not um, sure too many people are trying to manage for wasps. Don't think wasp management is a big part <laughs> uh, But the, the newer designs, there's one called a rocket box which is basically a vertical uh, wooden shell that fits over a wooden post, right. uh, a square wooden post with about an inch gap in between the shell and the post. And so those, those bats can kind of move around that post during the day to get the perfect temperature that they like. And um, it's called a rocket box and you can find plans for that on the internet. Uh, that was developed by the US Forest Service and that seems to be working very well. It looks like we got another question here. Um, participant in one of the NRCS programs sprayed field to eradicate fescue to try to establish native grassland after all grass was gone. Extreme infestation of Canadian thistle. Then told they had to eradicate all thistle by law. Has any of this changed or do you have any suggestions or maybe a little more information on that right, question? Right, 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 right. There is still a law in the books that landowners are responsible for controlling noxious plants. and. In my 25 years of experience, I have yet to have any landowner that said, hey, somebody came and told me, you know, that laid down the law that said that they had to get rid of certain plants. Um, yes, it's great to control Canada this. It's a very noxious plant. Um, and, if, and, 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 if, and if those thistles are present on the site, um, we have some herbicide solutions to help control right. those. And so that's definitely something that I would want to see done anyway right. for the success of the planting and to prevent the spread of that plant. Right, and ultimately they help out that landowner as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, right. help the yeah. landowner to uh, yeah. achieve their goals and right. to prevent more spread. Right, and maybe um, yeah. make your neighbors happy too if you're not helping spread the thistle. Exactly, else. exactly, you, you'd be a very good neighbor. Yes, but it's always good to be a good neighbor. It is. All right, um, let's see, next question. What to plant for a lawn, if not fescue, for a new home in the middle of the farm? Okay, that, yes, that is a very good question. Um, most folks, um, for a lawn area that is, that is gonna be mown um, in the same manner that most lawns are mown on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, 
Um, it is it is tough to get away from fescue, but there are there are different varieties of fescue. There is Kentucky 31 tall fescue, which is the predominant one across the ag landscape, and then there is a um, there there are some other varieties of fescue that don't have the fungus in them. Um, they don't cause as many problems, but if it's going to be a very well maintained area, right. some of those other fescues are probably going to be the best the best bet for a very well maintained lawn. Now, of course, they could always just let it kind of go natural, but that may not be the best for a lawn. Depends on where they live. Right, you're right. Yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> if they're in town, that may be an issue. Right, a good point, very good point. Yeah. All right, let's see, um, let's see. What to plant pump for a lawn? Um, risk or runoff from spraying of Roundup into nearby ponds or waterways? That's uh, another good question. Um, the reason why, the reason why we, um, opted for the glyphosate active ingredient found in Roundup years ago was because there are other products out there that will that will control the things that we want to control like fescue and do a great job but they were heavier herbicides. Mm -hmm. These are herbicides that would persist, they would leach into the soil and in the groundwater mm -hmm. and so when Roundup came out it is a very light herbicide that will break down the presence of sunlight mm -hmm. and rain and so it doesn't persist in the soil. It, it, uh, it uh, does not move around much at all. Mm -hmm. Once it dries on that plant, mm -hmm. it's, it, is, it is pretty much not going anywhere. Right. Um, there have been some studies that have come out that have showed that um, Roundup in water sources can cause unhealthy conditions for a lot of different animals. And to be honest, those studies involve heavy concentrations right. of Roundup directly applied into the water. Right. Now there's a formulation for near water, right? Is rodeo, is that? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Yes, yes, there is a uh, formulation called rodeo. Mm -hmm. They use a different additive, mm -hmm. which helps these herbicides stick to the plants. And that uh, different herbicide is compatible with uh, use over water right. for controlling things like cattails. Okay. So I guess if yep. you're close enough to water that it might be a concern, then rodeo might be the rodeo best form. Rodeo would, would, uh, would uh, be the better form. And, it is not so much the active ingredient mm -hmm. water quality as it is the additives that are gotcha. used. Okay. Um, so yes, that's, that's a very good idea. All right, got another one here. Um, are orchard grass and timothy fields mixed with clover harmful for wildlife? They are not. They they are not harmful. Um, they're a great alternative to fescue. Mm -hmm. If uh, there's a downside to orchard grass is that it starts out as a clump grass. It's not a turf grass at the beginning. So you, you get the benefit of some bare ground in between the clumps. But over time, um, those clumps will begin to spread and close right. in and create a turf. And so, no, it does not, it, uh, does not have that, that harmful fungus in it, mm -hmm. in the orchard grass. Um, it starts out with some nice bare ground, but over time, um, it will definitely turn into a uh, turf, which will crowd out the clover. So, going, so maintenance is gonna be required. Maintenance is required, sure. Okay. Yes. yes. All right, so how do we get rid of lilies covering a pond? Oh boy. Now you all got some assistance really for like pond management we as do, well, right? We do, we do, we do. We have, um, I am part of the wildlife division. We have a whole nother separate fisheries division and we've got district fisheries biologists. And if, if you look up your county contacts, you will see your district fisheries biologist. Mm -hmm. And any type of farm pond or pond management uh, questions you have should be directed to those folks yeah. because they are in the know and right. that's what they deal with daily. And so they're up to speed on all the, the latest developments and control of unwanted plants. Yeah. Just another great resource your organization offers. Absolutely. So. All right, folks, we'll take a final call for questions for Clay. I'll give you a quick minute to get those in. Otherwise, I'm going to release him from the studio. Um, right. And Clay, I really can't thank you enough. You know, your your agency, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, is such an important agency here in the state. And you Appreciate do so it. much for our landowners and our woodland owners. And I know many of our woodland owners really are interested in wildlife. You know, many yes. of them may have acquired the property for wildlife purposes, whether to hunt or just to see. Right. Um, so your all's ability to come out and work with them and help them achieve their objectives is a great thing. And, uh, Thank you on behalf of all the woodland owners here in well, Kentucky. Yeah, we really appreciate it. You're welcome, Billy. And thanks for everyone's time. Yeah, we appreciate you. All right, folks, so we're going to take about a five-minute break. Um, we'll be back at 8.15.
um, Eastern Time, 7.15 um, Central Time, and we'll get going with Dina Weeby. So you've learned a lot about a great, a lot of the things that you can do, and Dina's going to be talking about some of the financial assistance and how the Natural Resources Conservation Service can help you get those practices actually implemented on the ground. So we'll see everybody back at 8.15 Eastern Time or 7.15 Central Time. Thanks, and we'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, now let's try. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. Um, I hope you had a chance to stretch your legs there for a second and um, get back in your seats. Um, we've got a really exciting person coming up with us, Dina Weeby. Um, Dina works with the Kentucky Natural Resources Conservation Service. And Dina, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, we're glad to have you because, you know, we've been talking with Pam and then we talked to Clay and they talked about all these different things that are available as far as like technical assistance to come out, help landowners and make recommendations, but you actually do some stuff that can kind of help landowners actually get that stuff done, right? We do. I'm happy to tell you about tonight. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with Dina's presentation. And like we've done with the previous presenters, I'll ask you to go ahead and just keep typing those questions into the chat pod, and then we'll address those at the end. But right now, we're going to go ahead and pull up Dina's presentation. All right, like every good federal agency, we have a mission statement, and you can read it there on the, on the screen, but NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, provides leadership in a partnership effort to help conserve, maintain, and improve our natural resources and environment. A lot of words, but basically helping people help the land. So we've been around a long, long time. In fact, uh, we've been around since the Dust Bowl days. We started out in 1933 as the Soil Erosion Service, in 1935, we became the Soil Conservation Service. We were SCS until 1994, when we really realized that our mission was bigger than just soil erosion and soil conservation, but that we dealt, dealt with all the natural resources. So we changed our name to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We are not a regulatory agency. Even though we're a federal agency, we're not regulatory. And our services to you are at no cost, just like the two state agencies that spoke before me. And everything we do with you is voluntary. So we're a voluntary conservation agency. So as Billy mentioned, we provide uh, financial assistance, but we also provide technical assistance. Uh, we, if you have a natural resource concern on your soil, water, plants, air, or animals, you have an issue, we probably have something that can help you both technically and financially. Earlier I said our, our kind of tagline is helping people help the land. So both, my, um, both of the folks that spoke before me talked about developing a plan to decide what you needed to do. We also offer that service. We can help you develop a conservation plan. Uh, we want you to use your land. We're not a preservation agency, we're a conservation agency. We want you to use your land, but we want you to use it wisely. So conservation plans based on your objectives are where we start. We also, in the way of technical assistance, can provide engineering assistance. So if you need to build an animal waste facility to hold your, hold your animal waste, or if you need a grass waterway, or livestock watering systems, or uh, fencing, plans, we can help you with that as well. So what you all really want to hear from me tonight is about our financial assistance. So you've heard uh, enough about technical assistance probably tonight, but now you want to know how do I get the money to help me get some of that on the ground. So our agency, NRCS, will provide uh, financial assistance to you in a variety of ways. What I'm mostly going to talk to you tonight is that first bullet. We're going to, we can work with land users to implement the conservation practices or activities that have been identified in the we also have other programs that you don't hear a lot about. We have an Emergency Watershed Protection Program, or EWP, where we can provide funds to communities when natural disasters strike. So all this rain that we've had in the last few years, if a road washes out and the school bus can't get across it, we might be able to help that community get that road back in place and protect it for future use. We also have programs that uh, work with easements. We work with entities to provide matching funds where they can buy conservation easements to help protect farmland from development. So, even though we have 10 or 12 programs in Kentucky, I'm going to talk about uh, just a couple of those tonight. And like I said, they'll be part of that first bullet where we provide assistance directly to you, the land user. So how do we provide that assistance? So through those programs that I mentioned, and I wanted to say that all of our programs, our financial programs are competitive. So just because you apply to us doesn't mean you receive funding. We actually evaluate all the applications we receive and not all applications will be funded. If you are selected for funding, then the requirements, we have requirements that must be met. So voluntary conservation, but once you decide to take our funds, take our money, and you sign on the dotted line, there are requirements that you'll have to meet. We'll talk a little bit about some of those later. And of course, we can't do it alone. Um, you already heard from some of our closest partners today, the Kentucky Division of Forestry, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, University of Kentucky. Um, we have so many partners that, that work with us and uh, alongside us that we just can't do our job without them. So we really appreciate them. 
I mentioned that we have about a dozen programs here in Kentucky. The two that I'm going to highlight tonight are two of our most popular, Environmental Quality Incentives Program and a Conservation Stewardship Program. A lot of words on this slide, but um, I just want to say, if you've heard of a program that we have from NRCS, it's probably this one. The Environmental Quality Incentives Program is our biggest one nationwide. It's also our largest in Kentucky. We uh, last year provided nearly $20 million to landowners and land users in Kentucky under this program. We're size neutral, so it doesn't matter if you have a few acres or if you have a large number of acres, we can work with you. Um, I call EQIP our fix it program. <laughs> and you can kind of see uh, on the first bullet there that the purpose of this program is to promote ag production, forest management, and environmental quality as compatible goals. So again, we want you to use your land, we want you to produce on it, but we want you to do it in an environmentally smart way. I've got a list of just a few, a few of the practices that we, um, a few of the type of practices that we can uh, do with you. I listed the first two or three for wildlife and, and forestry. So you can see we do forest and improvement practices. We can help you get rid of invasive species such as bush honeysuckle, and we do a lot of that in Kentucky. If you're interested in pollinator habitat, we have a practice for that. If you have livestock, we can help you with grazing systems by increasing your, your water, maybe uh, increasing the water quality by keeping them out of streams and helping install pipeline and tanks for them to have better cleaner water. Maybe if you need some cross fencing to do better rotational grazing, we can help you with some of that. If you raise crops, we can help you improve your soil quality with cover crops or no-till farming. So we have something um, pretty much for everybody. You see my note there at the bottom, I think Pam already mentioned this, that in order to be eligible for NRCS financial assistance for forestry practices, the first thing you have to have is a forest management plan. So where do you get that plan? Pam already said that the Kentucky Division of Forestry could write that for you. We know they have a large backlog, so there's an alternative way you can also get the forest management plan. You can actually hire a technical service provider. Now KDF is going to write that plan for you for free, but the technical service provider is going to charge you. If you want to use a technical service provider, and this person is someone that our agency, NRCS, has certified to be able to write a forest management plan for you. If you want to use one of those people, you can find the list of who's been certified on our webpage. But if you want to use one of those people, you can come to us and apply for a, what we call a conservation activity plan, or a CAP. So if we approve that, then NRCS can help you pay for that TSP service. You may not pay 100% of what the TSP charges you, but you'll know what we'll pay and then you can negotiate with that TSP. Earlier I said that all of our programs are competitive and not all applications get funded. I will say that for these conservation activity plans, in most years we do fund 100% of those. So if you, if you need a conservation um, forest management plan, feel free to come in and sign up for conservation activity plan through EQIP. So we take applications for all of our programs year round. However, we do have to identify cutoff periods so that we can look at all the applications that have been received by a certain date and evaluate them and rank them. After we do that, we look at how far our money will go and if selected for funding, then either someone from our office, from NRCS, or one of our partner agencies will come out and work with you to develop a plan of operations based on your plan. So we already have the plan, now you're going to tell us which part of that plan you want to implement. Some of it, all of it, maybe just one piece of it. Um, so we'll work with you on that, we'll develop a, a timeline for you, which practices we'll install in which year. We'll ask you uh, to sign a contract with us and that's, that's where you have now committed that you will do certain things. So uh, on my second bullet there I said read the fine print. Our application is about four pages. Your contract will be anywhere from three or four pages to maybe 10 pages. Our appendix to our contract is 19 pages. It's what I call our fine print. Remember we're the federal government. There are rules and regulations attached to the uh, EQIP and every other program funds that we have. So make sure you read the fine print. Make sure you know what your responsibilities are. They're not that hard. It basically says that you'll stay on task. You'll get your practices done. Uh, they'll meet our standards, things like that. So it's not that hard, but there is a lot that you agree to, so make sure before you put your name on the dotted line that you've read that fine plan. So once you've signed the contract, we'll provide, or one of our partners will provide the technical assistance to help you get those practices uh, implemented according to the NRCS standards that, that our agency has. Once you get them done, we'll, we'll pay you what's in your contract. And 
Pam used the word cost share. We try not to use that word in NRCS much anymore. What we have now is a payment schedule. So we don't collect bills. In the old days, we used to collect bills and pay a certain percent of whatever you, whatever you had spent. Now we go into these contracts and say, well, we think this practice will cost X number of dollars and our payment schedule will pay you a certain amount and it'll be paid by a unit basis. So say we're gonna pay, if we think something's gonna cost you $100 to implement per acre, our payment rate might be $75 per acre. So we'll plan say 10 acres at $75 an acre. If once that your implementation is done and you've, and you've done all 10 acres, we'll pay you what's in your contract. If it turns out oh, you only needed six acres, then we're only gonna pay you that on a cost um, per unit basis. So we'll only pay you for those six acres. If the amount of money that's in the contract is more than you actually expended, that's fine. If it's less than you actually expended, that's, that's expected actually. But you know, if you're a good, good negotiator, you might get some uh, materials cheaper than what we think they should cost. You might get some labor cheaper. You may do it yourself and that will cut down on your costs. So what's in the contract is what you're going to get paid. We're not going to collect your bills. <laughs> so for equip, contracts are complete once the, the last practice has been, has been installed and paid. However, most practices have some sort of an expected lifespan that will outlive your contract. And part of that fine print that I mentioned earlier and say that you're required to maintain that practice for the length of the time that uh, the practice is supposed to last. And each practice is different and that will be listed in your contract. So um, you can, you can re reference your, your contract or ask your local NRCS or they'll help you with that. So I said you can apply any time of the year. We group our equip applications so that so the like applications compete against like applications. So somebody who wants to apply for a forestry practice won't compete against someone who wants a covered crop in the cropland uh, areas. Somebody that wants um, some wildlife, some wildlife work won't compete necessarily with someone in the pasture fund count. So forestry competes against forestry, wildlife against wildlife, and so forth. The conservation activity plans compete only against other conservation activity plans. So uh, that's the group that I say we, we typically fit fund all of those. Last year, 2018, we approved 79 contracts in the forestry fund account and approved $870,000 under EQIP. That money will go to helping nearly uh, 4,000 acres with improvements on the, on the forest land. I will tell you that last year we only received 84 applications. So forestry has one of the best success rates in getting uh, approval. So if you need work, make sure you come see us. Changing gears a little bit is to another program that, that a lot of people don't know about. The Conservation Stewardship Program has not been, been uh, very widely used in Kentucky. In the last few years, we've done more than we've ever done, but it's a very, very beneficial program. Where EQIP was kind of a fix-it program, CSP or the Conservation Stewardship Program is kind of a, a, a take, it, take it to the next level program. Um, CSP will help you maintain, manage, and improve what you've already got on the ground, and then we will pay you to do additional activities. A lot of those activities aren't exactly what we would consider equip practice. It may be more of a management or enhancement to something you've already done. Uh, some of them are, are unusual. Some of them are, are typical ag practices. Under CSP, eligible lands are broken into ag lands, which cover pasture and cropland, and non-industrial private forest land. So those compete separately. We're not going to compete your forest land against someone who has crop and pasture. Should you have both, say you have some forest land and some pasture land and you're interested in CSP, you can end up with two contracts, one for your woodland and one for your pasture land. If you have pasture and crop land, those will go in the same contract. We make payments based on how many acres you're including in the um, program to do something on, how many resource concerns you're addressing, and how many new activities that you will install. Equip contracts can be anywhere from one year up to 10 years. CSP is a little different in that all CSP contracts are five years. You'll get an annual payment for five years. Um, also in CSP, you have, to you have to enroll your entire operations, either your entire forestry operation or your entire cropland and pasture land together operation. I already said that we compete them separately. So CSP only competes against CSP in the same area of the state. So we do a geographical competition in these two. So East Kentucky, Central Kentucky, and Western Kentucky will compete only against those in their, in their vicinity. 
Last year in CSP, we enrolled 112 new CSP forestry contracts. Most of those were in Eastern Kentucky, and they cover over 17,640 acres. All right, so you've got a conservation plan or a forest management plan or a wildlife plan, and you think that's oh, time I now wanna, um, sorry, I think I missed the slide. So here's just some examples of some of the practices that you might include in your CSP. You see that some address woodlands, some address wildlife, those bottom three, um, we haven't done a lot of, but we think there's opportunity for those. Okay, so you've got your plan, you wanna implement some of it, but now how do you get the money? Well, come see us. First thing, we're gonna make sure that you're eligible to apply. So who's eligible? If you're an owner or an operator, so you don't have to own the land, but if you're an owner or an operator engaged in agricultural forest production on eligible land, and typically eligible land is private land. So if you're, if you're an operator of, of agroforestry on private lands, you're likely to be eligible. First question we're gonna ask you is, do you have farm records established with USDA? And if not, that's the first thing you'll need to do. So if you haven't already worked with your farm service agency to find to have a uh, farm number, farm attract number, that's the first place you'll need to visit. If you've had a tobacco uh, allotment in the past, you probably have a, a farm and track number. But if you don't, go to FSA, you'll need to uh, take with you a few things. You need to have your proof of identity, copy of your deed to show you own the land, and if you're operating as an entity, um, then you'll need your articles of incorporation and things like that. While you're there, they will ask you to fill out several pieces of paperwork. One is the highly erodible land conservation and wetland conservation determination. Basically that says that you're not cropping highly erodible land without a conservation plan and you haven't destroyed any wetlands. We'll also ask you to certify your adjusted gross income. If you make more than, or if you have made more than an adjust, of an adjusted gross income of more than $900,000 for any of the previous three years, then you're not eligible to receive an RCS program payments. I'm not sure, Billy, but I think I hear some laughter. Yeah, I would so, say that most of us will fall under that threshold. So that doesn't affect a lot of folks, but it does affect some. Um, if, and then on the bottom there, if you're operating as, a, as an entity, then there are other paperwork that you need to bring in. For power of attorney, we don't allow spouses to sign for each other without a power of attorney. So if you're gonna have a spouse come in and sign for you for a payment or for a contract uh, document, you'll need to fill out a, a farm service agency power of attorney form. A little note on the footnote on the bottom there is you must be in compliance with those first two things, the highly erodible land, wetland conservation part, and the adjusted gross income in order to participate in our CS programs. On our application, I'm not going to talk anything more about our application except for this one slide. On our application, we're going to ask you if you are one of these historically underserved groups. You don't have to answer, but if you're one of them, it's in your best interest to answer. So if you're a beginning farmer, that basically means you haven't farmed for more than 10 consecutive years, or if you're a limited resource producer, I know we all think we're limited resource producers, but there's actually uh, dollars attached to that. You can go to that website that's listed on the slide there to see what that is. Uh, if you're a limited resource producer, if you're a socially disadvantaged producer, which means you identify in one of the groups that's listed on your slide, or if you're a veteran farmer, as identified there, you, you'll want to identify that you're one or more of those groups. And the reason for that is if you are a historically underserved applicant, you will receive a higher payment rate. You'll qualify for an advanced payment if you need it, and sometimes you'll compete in smaller competition pools, which will increase your opportunity to get funded. So the higher payment rate, earlier I mentioned that we don't do cost share, but our payments are based on a certain percentage of what we think a practice should cost. For most practices, we use 75%. That's what Pam mentioned earlier, 75%. For the historically underserved group, we base it on a 90%. So you get a bump in, in your payment rate, and that's, that's pretty significant on some practices. For the advanced payment rates, if you need some funds to uh, purchase some materials to get you started, to uh, have a contractor move equipment in, uh, to do anything that, that you're ready to do, we can give you, if you're historically underserved, for, historically underserved uh, participant, we can give you up to 50% of the cost of that practice uh, to get you started. So it's just a little bit help there. So I hope you all know who we are, where to find us, but if you don't, you go to our website, click on contact us, from the pull down, you'll select local service centers. That map, the US map to your right there will come up, click on Kentucky, drill down to your county, and then a screen at the bottom there will pop up showing you who services your county, how to contact them. 
um, the phone number and their email. So I'm going to leave that screen up there. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, as you leave that up there, so y'all can see it, you do have it in your handout. I'll ask folks to go ahead and start getting questions in for Dina. And uh, Dina, I think um, when you're talking about those contracts, maybe some people might be initially intimidated a little bit about having to have all this information, but you know, the, the local folks at the local offices are so helpful and they're there to try to help landowners navigate this process. And I would encourage people to really work with your local resource people and um, get these contracts signed because it allows you to get these practices done and implemented. And that's really kind of why you had to plan why you're even here in this class right now is to try to learn how to care for your property. So really take advantage of those resources. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop um, Dina's presentation and we'll see if we've got a few questions here. All right. Oh, so Andrea, sorry you had a little difficulty hearing us there. Um, if you've got any um, questions or maybe you didn't get get something clearly, um, please go ahead and ask it. But we do have one here. Um, I have 200 acres planning a select cut on 40 acres. What would recommended minimum tree size be? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that's for you, Dana, or not. <laughs> well, I'm not a technical person. I'm your uh, financial assistance programs person. So um, I recommend that you get with either Kentucky Department of um, Fish and Wildlife or with Pam group over at right. Forestry and or contact one of our local folks and they'll help you with the technical questions. Sure and and I'll say Kara if there is any more details about that question we'll be try to uh, try to help you with that or whoever's asking that. Um, if it's for a commercial timber harvest obviously there are certain sizes that are going to be re required or needed at local mills um, and mills can differ as far as what they can take so if you can give me a little bit more detail we'll certainly try to go ahead and address that question but um, if we've got any more questions I'd love to hear some from De for Dina. Um, Dina so how many offices um, y'all have local service centers are they in every county or are they how's that kind of spread out? So we do service every county in Kentucky. However, we don't have offices. Uh, we don't have someone permanently located in every county. So we have 56 or 60 some uh, offices. Uh, some offices are better staffed than others. We have a conservation, we partner with conservation districts. They have an office in every county. So we have a presence in every county. We just, may just not have a full-time person in every okay. county every day. So but like you said, you can find your county and then find who serves that county um, through the website. Sure, and they can call the number or email them and, and the best way to find somebody is to set up an appointment with them. So if you want to be sure that they're there on Tuesday at two o'clock, set up an appointment. Okay, good, good point, good advice. All right. Any questions for Dana? If not, I'm going to release Dana from the studio. And, and I can't thank you enough. And really, your agency is so vital to everybody here in Kentucky or wilderness owners. Everybody's trying to practice good conservation. And you all really help make that happen. And, um, you know, I'm really appreciative of the relationship we have with your organization and, um, and how we can try to help all these woodland owners out there across Kentucky. So um, thank you very much, Dean. I thank really you. appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to be bringing in um, Dr. Ellen Crocker next. Um, Dr. Crocker is our newest forest health specialist here at the University of Kentucky, and we are delighted to have her on board. Some of you come on in, Dr. Crocker. Um, it's good seeing you, good having you with us. Hi everyone, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So like I mentioned, um, Dr. Crocker is our brand new, um, as February 1st, um, forest health extension professor, and she had been working with us for a few years before, and we were just lucky enough to kind of snag her um, before she went elsewhere. So, uh, Ellen, glad to have you with us. And, um, you know, this is a brand new position that you have here. We've never had a forest health extension professor here at UK, so uh, it's pretty exciting. It really is. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on board in this role and developing a kind of cohesive forest health program across the state. What that's going to look like is collaborating with a lot of different people and working with the agencies you've heard from, our fantastic forest for extension group that's already here. Um, you know, forest health is really diverse and it covers a lot of ground. Um, so I really look forward to that. All right. So we're going to pull up a short presentation here. Ellen's um, got for you to give you a little more information. Great. So again, thanks for having me on. Uh, so one of the first questions that I get uh, is, what is forest health? Um, you know, obviously I'm forest health extension, so what does that mean? And in truth, it's really tough to define because it means different things for different people. A healthy forest for one landowner who's more interested in timber, another who's more interested in wildlife, 
might be a little bit different, but it's really important that those forests need, meet the needs of those different landowners while being stable and sustainable. So if you kind of take a moment and close your eyes and imagine a healthy forest, um, what are the characteristics that it tends to have in common? I know that before this, you had another webinar on what were the threats that are out there, uh, but some of the things that come to my mind immediately are vigorous and diverse native species that have healthy canopies, a mix of different ages and sizes of trees that have new seedlings coming up and able to grow and replace older trees as they die. So I know from the earlier uh, webinar, you got a little introduction to what are some of the major threats to trees and forests. So insects and diseases is obviously very important. Here in this area, uh, the emerald ash borer is really affecting the health of our woodlands. Um, killing ash trees, it will kill the vast majority of the ash that we have in the state. If it hasn't hit your area already, it will in the near future. Um, so both dealing with that in the moment, but also preparing for it uh, if, if it's not to you already. Um, we have others. Hemlock woolly adelgid is very uh, important in some parts of the state. Both emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid are invasives, so they're a real challenge to manage. Um, at the same time, we have a variety of native insects and diseases that pop up every year. They tend to not be as big of a problem for the health of those trees, but at the same time, they can be really noticeable and a cause for concern. So just being aware of that, uh, we have invasive plants. You've already heard quite a bit about that tonight, uh, so I won't go into that, but just uh, they are a big challenge from a management perspective. And unfortunately, you know, there's no one silver bullet and it's not one invasive plant, it's a whole slew of them. Uh, and there's more on the way all the time. Um, we have a lot of aging woodlands with trees that are kind of getting older. And as that happens, they become susceptible to a lot of opportunistic insects and diseases. Uh, normally, they'd be able to fight them off like they would, uh, you would a common cold. Um, but once these trees get a little bit older, it's, it's harder for them to defend themselves against those problems. So being aware of that, uh, poor management, whether we're talking in a more urban landscape tree perspective or in a woodland as a legacy of uh, past management, um, that's something to consider. Site issues, weather, fire, many more threats out there. So I just kind of wanted to, to raise awareness of those things. And then my focal areas. So with the Forestry Extension Group, you'll probably be seeing more of me and the work that I'm doing. Um, and I'm really excited to be in this role. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing on trees and forest health, as well as diseases and insect pests of trees. And uh, in that photo, you can see me with some different fungi uh, that can cause root rot. Um, so just a wide variety of diseases and insect pests of trees, invasive plants, and how I can help. So I'm here uh, with the extension team. Um, I'm looking at what are the threats that are currently out there and how can you manage them? So it might be what are the invasive species that aren't here yet, but are on the horizon and we should you know, ha be on the lookout for, uh, to try to kind of contain them before they establish. It might be being more aware of the impacts of some of these invasive species that are already there. So one of the things that I worked on last year was surveying loggers about the types of damage that they were seeing to standing dead ash trees. Uh, so while emerald ash borer might not affect the quality of uh, timber, um, it, Lots of secondary issues certainly can. So ambrosia beetles and other things really affecting how long you have that before you need to get those ash um, out of your woodlands if you still want to make a profit from them. So if you're seeing anything unusual in your woodlands, um, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, maybe it's something that is a, is a normal issue that happens every year, but maybe this is something we need to know about and be on top of. Uh, so both, I work with Abe Nielsen of Kentucky Division of Forestry. He's their forest health specialist. And um, both of us would be very interested if you see anything unusual, uh, let us know. Um, whether this is tree mortality or widespread leaf loss. Um, I'm here to also help with any questions you have related to fungi, uh, how to grow them, 
what they are, yeah, ID and cultivation. And then I also work with a variety of different citizen science programs related to uh, forest health, as well as youth programs, uh, making youth aware of these different issues. So those are just kind of some of the things that I'll be working on. Uh, and uh, one thing that I just want to emphasize is that I want to hear from you. So this is my contact information. If you have ideas about, you know, what, what your biggest concerns are or what you'd like to see, uh, let me know. I'm new in this role, as uh, Billy mentioned, so would be excited to hear from you. Well, thank you, Ellen, so much. I do appreciate that. And Ellen's going to be able to stick around with us for a few more minutes. So if you do have some questions, I'll encourage you to kind of get those into the chat pod. You do have her contact information if you want to follow up later. Um, sometimes, you know, you may not think of a question until a little, a little bit later. So you do have her information to reach out to her. But Ellen, I'm going to go ahead and kind of show them a little bit about our website, some of the programs and some of the other resources that we have here at UK Forestry Extension. And um, I'll encourage you to stick around in case we get a few more questions coming in, but we'll kind of just navigate through this. So folks, if you haven't been to our department's website at the UK Forestry and Natural Resources Extension website, it's real easy to get to, just www.ukforestry.org, and you'll see our homepage there. We've got a number of different programs and educational resources, um, events, all kinds of things that are of interest to woodland owners here across Kentucky. Um, so please check that out. There's a phone number and you can re reach uh, Ms. Renee Williams there and she can direct you to wherever um, your question might be most appropriately answered. And um, a real quick shout out to Renee. She's behind the scenes helping making all this happen. Um, she's such a big part of all we do. You know, and we're really focused on sustainable forest management here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And really what that means is we want to manage the woods in a way that it doesn't compromise what future generations can do. So we want to do things that conserve our resources, that keep forests in forests, and make sure that we, we're putting things in a better shape for the next generation to come. So if you're interested in that, we've got a lot of different outlets that can try to help you, and you've heard from several of them tonight. Um, there are a number of threats, and we've talked about some of those, and it's just a general reminder to you that really leaving your woods alone is not a good option anymore. There's too many threats out there. Ellen mentioned invasive plants and insects, and, and I will tell you that the sooner we can get a handle on these, it, the better it is. Ellen, if we wait too long. That's really hard. If you can catch it before it spreads, then you are in much better shape. No doubt. Get that one little invasive plant before it becomes many, many more. Certainly fire is an issue. You heard Pam talk about that a bit. And there's some things that we can do to help alleviate that. We can put in good access roads. We can put in fire breaks. We can thin overcrowded stands. There's a number of practices that we can do that can kind of help those trees um, be successful and withstand the fires that do come through. Another issue can be timber theft and trespass. Is, this is especially true if you're an absentee landowner or if your property is really remote. Um, this doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And if it does happen, it's a really big deal to you. So just another reason that you can't really just leave your woods alone. Um, doing nothing is not a good option anymore. And now I wanted to kind of highlight is several kind of communication outlets that we have available for you all through our forestry extension team. I've mentioned our website already. That's kind of the gateway to get all of our information. We also have periodic constant contact or little electronic newsletters that we can send directly to your email box. You can sign up for those by visiting our website. You see we have several different ones. So when you go to sign up for that, you can select all the ones that you want to receive or just maybe pick the very one that you're interested in. Also want to mention um, Kentucky Woodlands Magazine. Um, Pam mentioned this earlier. This is a partnership effort with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. We are in our 12th year of producing this magazine. We've got more than 20 issues online. And many of those articles that are available online are really kind of timeless when it comes to forestry and wildlife issues. Um, maybe a few things have changed over the years, but generally the essence of that content is still solid. So it's a great resource to check out some of um, many topics that may be of interest to you. The other thing that we've started recently, and this is um, Renee Williams and uh, Laura Laka, who is a, a, a manager of our student population here at the department. They have this show called From the Woods, Kentucky. 
It's a weekly radio show, and you may not get it if you're not in Central Kentucky on live radio. However, they are recording every one of these and making them a podcast. Now, Ellen, I know you've been on a couple of these shows. Oh, yeah, and I've listened to a lot more. It is really fun. Uh, I always learn something from them. So if you're interested in this yeah. topic, check them out. Yeah, I would encourage you to visit um, our website. You can find out more. You can also get these as a um, podcast um, subscription. So you can subscribe to them through um, Google Play or the Apple Store. So check that out. It's a great resource when you, you're out on the road a little bit. Um, just download it on your phone and you can check it out and listen to it. And Renee asked me as well, if you do happen to be on Facebook, she said, please like our Facebook page. It will get you in the know about upcoming programs and events. And it's a way for us to kind of communicate to use different outlets and opportunities. The other thing I wanted to quickly mention is we have a number of really uh, um, soon upcoming programs that are a great way for you all to get additional information and go to some live programs with, um, with presenters in the rooms. The first one I want to mention is coming up March 30th. This is the Ohio River Valley Woodland and Wildlife Workshop. This is the program that we've been working with um, states of Indiana and Ohio for the last 10 plus years to put on this program. And it rotates amongst those three states each year. And next year it will be in Kentucky. Um, but we always try to keep it real close to the borders of each of those states. And you can check out that Tri-State Woods um, website there and get more information about that. But this is a great program um, and a number of us will be there and you'll have presenters from both um, Indiana and Ohio as well. So it's a great opportunity to meet some fellow woodland owners um, and meet some experts from around the region. So please check that out and registration is open and available for you on that right now. The next thing I wanna talk about is our Woodland Owner Short Course. And um, this is a program that we all put on together here out of the Department of Forestry, but we include 10 different agencies across the state. And you heard from three of the major ones already, um, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, Kentucky Division of Forestry, NRCS folks, and many more. So this is a great program, we think. Um, so you can come out, we do one of these in both the West, Central, and East regions of Kentucky, and you can see those locations. Those are all on Saturdays, and we did that purposefully. So if you're if you're working folks and and you got a job to go to during the week, um, we wanted to make sure that you could come and um, spend some time with us on Saturday. So I really encourage you to check this out. Um, we'll we don't have registration up for that now, but we will before too long. And what I will tell you about the Wilderness Owner Short Course is we have two programming tracks. We have one programming track if you're just getting started and you're maybe not really sure what you can do with your woods or who you can help uh, or, or who can help you. And then we also have one for more advanced woodland owners that may already have a management plan and they've been working with professionals for a while. So really regardless of your interests or your level of experience and expertise, there will be something for you at your woodland owner short course. So please um, plan to join us this summer at one of those short course events. The other thing I wanted to mention quickly before we wrap this up is we have a number of other recorded webinars on our website. This one will be one of those in the very near future, um, but there's probably 10 or more out there already. We've got a bunch of how-to videos as well. So there's many um, videos on how to do different practices on how you can evaluate your woods, how you can apply herbicides, how you can cut trees, girl trees, really a lot of different things. And that content is growing all the time, it really is. So I'd encourage you to check out our website and you can quickly find our YouTube channel there and you can find our recorded webinars. I will also say that all of the From the Woods Kentucky podcasts are available on YouTube as well. So you can actually listen to them through YouTube if that's an easier way for you. So please take advantage and check out all those resources that we have available at ukforestry.org. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over for questions for Ellen or myself. Um, if you do have questions now, I encourage you to use the chat pod. Um, but if you do have questions later, visit us online, send us an email, give us a call, and you can always reach us through your local county extension agent. And if you don't know your local county extension agent, um, I hope you'll get to know that person or, or several people in most offices. They are a great resource to help you regardless of what you're trying to do on your property. And we work to try to support them as well. So if you've got questions after tonight, please start with them and they can get you pointed to the right place. So um, Ellen, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off and see if we got a few questions in our, our chat pod here. Let's see. Uh, 
We have had yellow poplar dying in Clay County. Do you have any ideas about cause and is this happening across the state of Kentucky? So I'm gonna give this one to you. So I haven't heard about yellow poplar uh, mortality across the state, but there are a number of different kind of native issues that pop up each year on them. Um, every summer, but some summers more than others, you get yellow poplar weevil um, that in the summer will turn the foliage brown it looks really, really visible. It looks like the tree is dying, um, but really it's just this native insect that's causing some damage. It doesn't tend to permanently damage the tree too much. However, if you are noticing some yellow poplar uh, mortality, widespread mortality, that's kind of more than just one tree here or there, um, definitely let me know. Like, Send me an email and I'd be interested to learn more about it. And uh, I see a, a post there about possible causes of mortality to kind of small diameter red oaks. Um, there are a lot of different things that could do that. It's really hard to know without knowing, you know, the context of what you're talking about. I think when uh, Billy mentioned your local cooperative extension agent is really a fantastic resource for you because they can maybe come out and look at your property, um, get some ideas, maybe they have you know, some good context of what other people in your area have been seeing. Uh, we are seeing oak, uh, red oak mortality, but more of those older trees as they start to age. A lot of things that normally the tree would be able to defend itself from, it really can't. Uh, so especially in those older age classes, that's something um, to be expected and is part of why, you know, management can be a good idea because we expect to see those failures, you know, happening. Um, but with those younger trees, I think that's something that's that's maybe a little less normal as long as they have all the other resources they need, like light. Um, so that's something that I definitely follow up with someone on. I was going to say through our local county offices, they have uh, the access to a diagnostic lab so they can submit samples. And, you know, if you've got pictures, they can get them to appropriate experts. So, um, you know, work with your local county agent on some of those issues. And it's also good for them to know what's going on. So it's a great way for them to kind of keep up because if you're having that issue or, uh, or whatever issue it is, um, there's a good chance that some of your neighbors or other folks in the county may be having the same. And that plant diagnostics lab is a fantastic resource. Um, and I believe it's free if you go through your, your local extension office. Um, so definitely if you're having issues, um, bring in a sample, drop it off, and they can take a look at it for you. So just a tremendous amount of resources. And I hope that's what everybody took away from tonight's presentations is that there are many people and many organizations that are really very eager and excited to try to help you all take care of your woodlands. And we all benefit from well cared for woodlands. You know, one of the reasons that they have the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, Financial Assistance Program is because they know it's an investment that benefits all of us. If we can help support good conservation practices and help woodland owners take care of their property, society benefits overall. It really does. So that's why those programs exist. All right, Ellen, looks like we got another question in on white pine. So we've got another question on white pine uh, decline mortality. Um, someone has three white pines of different heights um, that uh, died, but the majority are still fine. Uh, this was a really wet year. And so a lot of the fungal diseases that affect uh, um, trees with needles, pine, spruce, fir, um, were, were really out in abundance this year. Um, I have no idea what might have killed those particular three white pine. However, uh, the plant diagnostics lab uh, that Billy mentioned is a great place to send something. They can tell you if it's uh, a disease and you know, which disease it might be, what are your management options based on that. Um, I think uh, there's many different issues that can affect pine. So my first question would be kind of wondering about what's the rest of the context there. If everything else is looking fine and it's just three trees, um, you know, maybe that's less concerning than if it's something that could possibly spread and affect the rest of your trees. Um, so, so lots of different options out there and some really good resources um, to go to to find more information on that. Good, good. More questions, please get them. You're, you're welcome there, Mr. Cooper, PJ Dewar. I'm glad to answer that one. Any other questions, please get them in. For Ellen or myself, we'll be happy to try to address them. 
Of course, you have our contact information. If you get home and you think of something else, um, you're welcome to reach out to us. But again, I'd encourage you to kind of work through your local county extension agent. It keeps them in the loop and they need to know what's going on in their county as well. And with that said, I want to take this chance to really thank all of our local county extension offices for opening up their doors this evening and this whole series and being a part of this webinar series. And like I mentioned before, our job is to try to support these county agents in forestry and wildlife programming. And um, we're just so thankful for you all for um, helping be part of this program. And a big thanks to each and every one of you woodland owners out there who have come and been part of this as well. We had a number of foresters and others that have been at some of these offices throughout this series. So really thank you all. I greatly appreciate all you all do for Kentucky's Woodland Owners. And, uh, and while I'm passing out the thanks, we've got Renee Williams behind the scenes, uh, making sure everything goes nice and smooth for us. So Renee, thank you. Well, folks, if there's no other questions, I've got nine o'clock on the wall and um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Um, but again, thank you all so much. Please follow up with us or your local agent Join us at some of our programs across the state, and um, we would love to meet you and, and learn about what you're trying to do on your woodlands and try to get you connected to the resources that you need to get the most from your woodlands. So thank you all so much, and um, you know how to reach us if you've got any questions, and um, we're going to go ahead and sign off then. Thanks much.